as we dive back in this morning, I have to point something out for those who are checking in with us online, because most of you won't see it in the room, but you guys will when I go to read. I have a mark on the top of my head. It's not because I cut myself. I was not paying attention walking in my basement and walked right into the crossbeam, and it just sort of skims. It's never like a smack. It's just a skim, but it's always enough to cut my head or mark my head and be very annoying. And when you have a bald head, if you get a mark, it's visible forever. So you'll see that. It's there. You guys might not see it, but it's there. We're in this series, The Mission, and we're just talking about God's mission for us, looking at Jesus' call and his command to go and make disciples. And the importance of the mission is that it gives us direction. It allows us to understand how we utilize our resources and our time. If we lose sight of the mission, we start then getting distracted from where our resources should go and what we should be focusing on. And we see that in so many ways. There's a simplicity to that. Maybe even in the smallest of missions, it's very easy to lose sight of mission. It's very easy to get off track. So I don't know ever done this and maybe it's just a sign of age but you ever walk into another room to do something or get something only to walk into that room and forget why you went into that room that's how quickly a mission can fade that I was in one room had an idea walked into the next room why did I come in here that's how quickly a mission can fade I don't know if you ever thought about this it's always kind of bothered me it makes me kind of panicky even when I'm watching a movie or watching a film and it's dire circumstances. The world is about to end. Thanos is going to snap his finger or Sauron's going to get the ring that rules all other rings. And somehow in that moment, everybody else has time to have dialogue. Like they stop. And they're having a conversation. And, and I'm always thinking, like, we don't have time for this. What are you doing? The world is going to end. So I'll give you a little glimpse into it. I know some of you, you're not gamers. The last game you played maybe was Pac-Man. But it's, it's emphasized in gaming. In gaming, it's the same situation as a movie. But you play as the character. And maybe in, in a game, there's this mission that has to be accomplished. So you're going to save the world or save your friend. Or you, you're going to fix the issue that's happening. But there are these things in games that are called side missions or side quests, and they could be the most frivolous things. I'm not exaggerating. You could be, the, the world is coming to an end, and some lady shows up and says, I've lost my frying pan. Can you help me find my frying pan? <laughs> or can you help herd some sheep or chicken? Like, really, is this the best use of my abilities and time? The world is coming to an end. Sure, I'll go help you herd those sheep. Let's, let's do that. That's how crazy it is in that, that world. Maybe, okay, you're like, okay, you're just a nerd. I don't live in that world. Think about it in this standpoint. You're Christmas shopping. You're out in the stores, or maybe you do all your shopping online. Your goal is to get presents for everybody on your list earlier than you tend to each year. And then you start shopping. You know, I really need a new pair of jeans. Yeah, I was interested in looking in, at a new pair of sneakers as well. And before long, you're headed to the car. You have an armful of bags. None of them are for anybody else. You just shop for yourself the entire time. That's how quick it is for us to lose sight of mission. And as we continue to look at Jesus' call to the mission of taking the gospel to the world around us, to call people to be disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to be challenged to stay on mission because it is so easy to get distracted and lose sight of the mission. Jesus will call us to stay on mission, and we'll see it as we progress through the Gospel of Luke. We'll see the disciples constantly losing sight of the mission that Jesus Christ has called them to. So as we challenge ourselves this morning to stay on mission, what I want to do as we dig through the text, I want us to look at signs that we might have lost sight of the mission. We're going to look at signs that we've lost sight of the call that Jesus Christ has given us. And here's the first one. We we know we've lost sight of the mission when we marvel at anything other than Jesus Christ. When we become awed by anything other than than the person of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to give some background. Pastor Pete shared about this last week. He talked about the transfiguration of Jesus. 
Jesus took a select few disciples. He went up into the mountain. He peeled back the humanity that he had put himself in and showed them his deity. And it's an indication. We get this concept, and maybe you hear this if you listen to preaching across the nation. You get this idea of Jesus tossed off his deity. He did not. He was still fully God. What he did in that moment is he kind of peeled back the humanity, and they saw him for who he is. And the moment was so glorious And so breathtaking that Peter didn't know what to say. He starts fumbling through his words and saying crazy, chaotic things. And God, the Father, speaks in that moment and says, this is my son. Listen to him. Focus on him. And it's this beautiful moment. And they come down the mountain. And when they come down the mountain, this is the scene they find. The next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they could not. Jesus says, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the impure spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. Look at the contrast of experiences. Jesus, Peter, James, and John are on the mountain. And they're seeing Jesus in all of his glory and all of his deity. And the Father is present. And the Father's speaking. And this just this beautiful picture. And they come down the mountain and they walk right back into the brokenness of the world. There's a young boy who's being tortured by a demon. Tossed to the ground in convulsions. A father panicking. Crowds are coming around to try to be a part and to see, and they surround Jesus. The disciples are unable to do something about the issue. And we read in Mark's account of this story, the disciples are actually arguing with the teachers of the law. So Jesus comes down, his disciples are, his disciples are arguing while a boy is convulsing on the ground, while crowds are surrounding. It's a chaotic picture. And the contrast of what he had just experienced to what he returns to is so drastically different. And I see Jesus say, he makes a statement, I I can't help but read in that statement a sense of frustration, a sense of brokenness. For many years of reading this and I'm thinking this seems so inconsistent. The way Jesus responds, you you unbelieving and perverse perverse generation, how long do I got to put up with you? Like, how long do I got to be here? I've always read that and felt like it doesn't seem consistent with his other times of healing. But as I I recognize the, the contrast of the reality, it's actually the most consistent or most realistic statement he could ever make. God, sinless, walks into the brokenness of humanity and says, oh man, how long do I got to put up with this? He sees the glory on the other side of the mountain. And he recognizes in all of this chaos, I believe that he sees there's a lack of faith. We read in the other accounts of this story That Jesus had more interaction than Luke writes here with the man, the father of the son. The father, in coming to Jesus, says, I I beg your disciples to do something they couldn't. And then he says to Jesus, he says, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus asks, if I can? He says this, everything is possible for one who believes. If? If? The question is not my ability. The question is your belief. And he goes on to say to him, or the, young, or the father says to him, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. There was a lack of faith there. And Jesus also indicates, and we read in the other text, that the disciples lacked faith. My perception is that they've forgotten whose name held power. They had just been sent out 
in groups of two to cast out demons and heal and share the message of the gospel. And they came back and said, Jesus, we saw demons flee. Jesus, we've been healing in your name. And they're excited about that. And now all of a sudden they can't do it. And I think in the process they lost sight of the power that could actually cast out demons. It was the power in the name of Jesus Christ. And I believe that they started believing they had some power. And they had forgotten that it was Christ alone who could cast out demons and bring healing. Notice that there is maybe only one character in this story who truly understands who Jesus is. And it's the demon controlling the boy. When the boy comes close to Jesus, the demon tosses him him into another convulsion. The demon knows who Jesus is. And when Jesus says, leave, the demon listens and leaves. He is not confused about who Jesus Christ is. It's everybody else who's confused about who Jesus Christ is. There's a lack of faith in a situation. We read that after he casts out, Jesus is still sympathetic. His issue is not with this boy. He still casts out the demon. He still heals him and gives him back to his father. His issue is with the unbelief of the generation. He says, you perverse an unbelieving generation. It's the people surrounding him. It says they, they were amazed at what occurs, but I don't think they were amazed at who caused it to occur. As we read this, Luke writes, while everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, they're marveling at all that he did, he said to his disciples, listen carefully, literally let this go into your ear. Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them so that they did not grasp it and they were afraid to ask him about it. Jesus reminds them of his mission in the midst of this moment. I am going to be handed over to the same men that are marveling and I will be killed and I will be buried and I will raise the third day. They marveled at what Jesus did. They didn't marvel at who he was. Many of the individuals in that crowd would not long from then be calling for his crucifixion. We lose sight of the mission when we marvel at anything other than the person of Jesus Christ. When in life we marvel at what he's done for us and the blessings we've received and the blessings we experience, we've lost sight of the mission. Because it's not what is done, it's who has done it. When we as a church marvel at anything that's been accomplished in this church and fail to recognize the one who accomplished it, we've lost sight of the mission. We can be assured then that when, when something amazes us and it's not the person of Jesus, it's what he does or offers us, our mission as a church is not to lead people in their next step to what Jesus will do for them. Our mission is to lead people in their next step to Jesus, the person. When we marvel at anything other than him, we've lost sight of the mission. Here's a second sign. When we, have, we've, we know we've lost sight of the mission when self supersedes service. Again, the d- disciples don't quite understand what's going on. Jesus says, I'm, I'm going to be handed over. I'm going to die. And they don't get it. And they don't ask. And I think maybe there's an aspect in which they don't want to get it. They have a perception of where this is heading and what they hope it will become. Rule, authority, power. We see that because right after that statement, Luke writes, an argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus just said, I am going to be handed over and killed. They start arguing about who's the greatest. And probably the argument started because three of them just had a very significant experience. 
we see in the context, they seem to be the most vocal. It's John and James who will speak the most as we progress through the text. I think the argument starts because they're wrestling with who's really the, the cherished ones, who are the favored ones in Jesus' eyes, who's going to sit in the highest positions. They're arguing about that, and maybe Peter, James, and John feel like they, they are going to because they had this experience. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, he took a little child and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, whoever welcomes this child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me, for it is the one who is least among you all who is the greatest. Jesus points to those who in their cultural setting would not be served, and he says, whoever serves them serves me. As they're wrestling with this concept of greatness is defined by how many people serve you, Jesus flips it and says, no, greatness is defined on how much you serve others. In fact, Mark would share and say that Jesus said, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He doesn't squash their desire for greatness. He just defines how greatness is actually found. I'll be honest, in my life, I longed for that. I long for greatness. But too often, I've been caught up in what the world defines as greatness. And I'm always called back to that text and to this text here where Jesus reveals where greatness actually comes from. It comes from service. From serving others and doing for others. And notice that he says, in my name. Whoever serves this child in my name. It's not detached from him. Because I can serve and do all kinds of kindness in this world, but detached from the name of Jesus Christ, it may benefit them, but it does not benefit me. I cannot earn my way into the relationship with the Father. It is only through my attachment to the name of Jesus Christ that I have entry into the kingdom of heaven. Because of that attachment, I now respond in service. When I lose sight of service, when service or self supersedes service, I've clearly lost sight of the mission. My love for God, I've said this before, my love for God is inseparably connected to my love for others. How quickly the disciples have forgotten that being a disciple of Jesus means denial of self. I believe that when we are more concerned about status or position, we've lost sight of the mission. I believe that when we are more concerned about what we receive than what we can offer, we've lost sight of the mission. I believe that when we gather together as a body of believers, when we come with the mindset of what is in it for me rather than what, I, what can I give to build up the body of Christ, we've lost sight of the mission. Many of you, my brothers and sisters, you've been in faith for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, what can happen is we can very easily slip into our own desires and preferences. My encouragement to you is to utilize that knowledge and that growth and that maturity to help others be edified and grow in their faith. Serve in a small group. Show up to kids, men. I know that's super scary. Serve as a small group leader for a seven-year-old who needs to know what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Show up to, to level up youth group. Talk to a middle schooler. And some of you are like, no way, never do it. If God has been working and you've taken step after step after step, he has now pro provided you with the ability and the gifting to help someone else take a step. When we could easily get caught up with self and preference, when really service needs to be the highlight, when I allow self to supersede service, I've lost sight of the mission. Here's a third sign. We lost sight of the mission when standing with us matters more than standing with him. We've lost sight of the mission when standing with us matters more than standing with him. There's this constant back and forth between Jesus and the disciples. He tells them something, they miss something. He tells them something, they miss something. Here's what happens. 
John says, Master, we saw someone driving out demons in your name. Notice that continual concept, in your name. We saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he is not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. Now, I want you to notice the contrast. What just happened when Jesus came down from the mountain? A boy is possessed by a demon, and they are unable to do what? Cast out the demon. And now John, at some point in the journey, he's come across somebody who, in the name of Jesus, he believes in Jesus, he understands the power and authority in the name of Jesus, he's casting out demons, and it doesn't say he's trying to, it says he is. He's accomplishing it. They have not accomplished it. They failed. And John says, we saw this guy doing it, and we told him to stop doing it. Because he's not with us. Jesus says, if he's not against you, he's for you. In Mark's account, Jesus would go on and say, there's nobody who could, in the spirit of God, do something miraculous, and then in that same spirit say something evil about me. The Spirit of God consistently works and consistently speaks. John's issue is that he's not a part of our group. The wording that he uses when he says he's not one of us, it's literally he does not follow us. It's the same exact Greek word that Jesus used earlier when he said, whoever wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow us. Me, accompany me. In essence, what John failed to realize is there is no us in the situation of following. It's him. It's not, Lord, we said stop because he's not following us. Jesus, no. The call to to discipleship is not follow us. It's follow him, follow me, the Messiah. John had lost sight, and I think it's so easy for us to get, particularly in our culture now, to get in a place where we're more concerned about people following us than we are about them following him. The mission of CEFC is not helping people take their next step closer to CEFC. Because some, that mission's small. Somebody could take their next step closer to CEFC and still be separate from the Father in heaven because they've not stepped towards the Son, Jesus, who gives them salvation. But if there is somebody in this community or around the world who takes a step closer to Jesus and never once takes a step closer to CEFC, praise the Lord. That's the mission Now, I love that people are a part of what we're doing as a church and that you've come together and said, we believe in this mission. I celebrate that, but the mission is not this church. If there are other churches in our community and around the world who share the mission that we share, we can celebrate what they're doing because it's not taking a step closer to us. In our cultural setting. I believe we've gotten to a place where it matters to us more whether people stand with us than whether they stand with him. We're in a place, let's be honest about it. We're in a place now where your thoughts and opinions are no longer secret. And I feel like, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like there was a time where we we all have opinions. There's no escaping that. I won't share my grandfather's tagline for opinions, and it's not appropriate. We all have them, and we've all had them all along. But now it's almost like it's in a place where those are, you can't hide it. It's front and center. Where you stand on certain things is front and center. The issue is that we've allowed the opinions to be the thing that matters most, And that's what we're determining whether we can connect with somebody or not. With masks and mandates and vaccinations and political parties and all the stuff. And I'm not saying they don't matter. 
But what we're doing is we're heightening them to say, do you stand with me? And if you don't, we can't have any interaction. That is not the church. As the church, we should be able to be people who in our opinions disagree, but we stand with him. And because we stand with him, we can come together. Listen, I have opinions. And I would imagine that I have plenty of them that a lot of you would not like. But I am not called to preach my opinions. Who is Phil? In the seven or eight billion people who live in this world and the billions who have lived before, who is Phil? Nobody really cares. I'm not called to preach my opinions. It's one of the reasons I try to as best as possible to not go there. I'm called to preach God's word because it's him and whether we stand with him that matters. And we're in a cultural setting where we're stuck in wrestling over, do you stand with us? Are you on my side of the mass conversation? What matters most, the mission, when we lose sight of that, when it matters more that they stand with us than with him, we've lost sight of the mission. Here's the fourth and final. We know we lost sight of the mission when we choose revenge over redemption. Luke writes, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him. And guys, maybe the pad's a little too early because I'm going to speak a little longer here. They're going to hear the music behind and they're going to be confused. I'm going to speak a little longer here. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Whoa! Whoa! But Jesus turned and rebuked them. And we're told what he says, but he rebukes them, and then he and his disciples went to another village. Jesus begins his trip. He's heading to Jerusalem, and he knows why he's going there, to die, to be buried, to raise again on the third day. And as they're going, they're going to travel through Samaria to get to Jerusalem. Most because of the tension that gives you, give you some background, there was tension that existed between the Samaritans and the Jews. The Samaritans were sort of descendants, Jewish descendants, who they, many of them were of the impoverished Jewish people who stayed in the area when the Assyrians took control of the northern kingdom of Israel. And over time, whether it was true or not, The Jews who were taken captive into Assyria believed that those who stayed behind and the descendants of those who stayed behind were half-breeds. It's the terminology they used of them, that they were descendants of those who were from Assyria and Jews. And that may not have been true. They they could have been pure-blood Jewish individuals. They just remained in the area. But there was this... uh, perception that they had developed, a prejudice, and it created tension. And over time, the Samaritans returned that tension because they they felt that prejudice. They also believed that Jerusalem was not the place you worship God. It was a place in their own area. And we see that in Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan at the well. So many times, Jews going to Jerusalem would actually make a much longer trip and go around Samaria so they didn't have to deal with them. And if a Jewish man or woman did travel through Samaria, many times the Samaritans didn't show them hospitality because they didn't believe Jerusalem was the place to worship and there was tension. And that's the situation here. Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. He's going to go through Samaria. He's not going around. And on the way, he's not welcomed. And they say specifically he's not welcome because he was heading for Jerusalem. And the response of James and John to not being welcomed, to being rejected, is, Lord, let's call down fire from heaven and consume them. Now, in their history, there was a prophet named Elijah. 
And there's, there have already been conversations. Who is Jesus? Is he Elijah? Is he Elijah come back to life? In their history, there was a prophet named Elijah who had called down fire from heaven. If you read, I believe it's in 2 Kings, the beginning of 2 Kings, Elijah's on a mountain. An evil king is sending little army groups to go get him from that mountain. One army group comes in a lot of pride and the general in pride and arrogance says, Elijah, come down. The king wants to see you. And Elijah calls fire down from heaven and he's consumed in his whole army. So the king sends another group. That guy comes. Same situation happens. Elijah calls fire down from heaven. He's consumed and doesn't go back. And then a third guy comes. Now think about the scene. I, I don't think we picture There are two charred groups of armies there. The third guy shows up and falls on his knees and says, Elijah, show show mercy to me. And Elijah shows mercy, comes down and goes to the king. So that's the historical context. So as they're thinking about Elijah and rule and power, they rejected us? How dare they reject us? Lord, we should call fire down from heaven to destroy them. We're not told what Jesus says, but he rebukes that. It's not my mission. They were more concerned about calling the destruction of God upon others than the redemption of those individuals. I feel like too often we as a church in general... We as Christians in general are more concerned about seeing God's judgment come than seeing individuals find the redemption that can be found in Jesus Christ. Listen, I don't want to ignore the reality. Judgment is coming. I just started reading through Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah talks about in the last days, And he says some things that you don't hear in many modern day sermons. Speaking in the last days, he says, The pride of mankind will be brought low and human loftiness will be humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted on that day. He says, The idols will vanish completely. People will go into caves in the rocks and holes in the ground away from the terror of the Lord and from his majestic splendor when he rises to terrify the earth. Later again, it says, away from the terror of the Lord and from the majestic splendor when he rises to terrify the earth. Wow. Those are words you wouldn't hear preached. In the last days, those days are coming. And those who have rejected the Son, Jesus Christ, will, will wear on their shoulders the condemnation of the Father. But presently, we live in an age of grace. It's not that God is looking past sin or ignoring sin. It's that Jesus bore the punishment of our sin. The wrath of God, the terror of God was poured out on Jesus Christ so that all those who believe in him will not be condemned. He's taken it. And we live in that age, so our heart and our desire should be that others receive that grace, that they understand and know that the Lord has covered their sin, that they can be free from the condemnation, that they can be free from the wrath of God. Too often our heart is, and I know it's true of me, and I believe that it's probably in times true of you, we desire for God to to rain down fire from the heavens. We're more like James and John saying, Lord, send out fire. And I pray that God would change our hearts to say, Lord, pour out your grace. Give redemption. Free individuals from the sin that has captured them because of the love of your son, Jesus Christ. When we are more concerned about revenge than redemption, it's clear we've lost sight of the mission. We need to stay on mission. It's too easy. It's too easy to lose sight of it. Jesus was very clear about his mission. As Luke writes, he says, he was resolute towards Jerusalem. His face was set on Jerusalem. He knew where he was going and he knew what was there for him. 
but his face was set on it. His face was set on the will of the Father. His face was set on you. In Hebrews 12, we read this, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorned its shame. The joy set before him was you. That you would come to know the forgiveness that is found in Jesus Christ. That the condemnation of the Father would be taken from you, passed to him, so that you could receive his righteousness and have entrance into, king, into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus stayed on mission. It is imperative for us, maybe more so today than ever, to stay on the mission that Jesus has called us to. Let's pray. Lord, I ask for your strength because I know that in my own heart, and I believe in the hearts of those listening here and at home, we are so easily distracted. The world throws at us so many different missions, things to pursue. It's easy for us to look back and kind of look at the disciples and think, how foolish. They just seem to miss it, and they keep missing it, and they keep missing it, but we're no different, Lord. We are them. You continually point us back to the mission you've called us to, and we lose sight, and we get caught up in material pursuits, or we get caught up in our own agendas, or serving self, or power, or authority, or whatever it is, Lord, I pray that we, CFC, would be a church that stays on mission, that our heart would be to help people know you, to take a step closer to you. That's what matters more than anything. And Lord, I pray as we close this morning and declare who you are through song, that we would marvel at who you are, nothing else. We would not celebrate what happens here, what we've done beyond celebrating the one who is behind it all, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray.